Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if you want to find your way to your seat, we can go ahead and get started here. Um, but before we do, we'll do a little housekeeping. Um, the restrooms are located in the back of the building, so if you go out through this door in the back, they'll be around to the side. The emergency exits are located all along this side of the, of the auditorium here. Um, there will be an opportunity at the end of the session today for questions and answers or a comment period. So if you're interested in, in making a comment or have a question that you would like to have answered, you can go ahead and sign up at the sign up sheet. It's uh, on the table in the back of the room. And we will uh, sort through those as we go through the session at the end. Um, the other thing is if you want to, if you think of a question uh, after the fact that you want to have answered, you can go ahead and submit that to the uh, CalFriend at caloes.ca.gov uh, email address, and then our staff can go ahead and collect all of those questions and, and get a response to you after the fact. Um, additionally, the link to the video for this event will be posted on our website, and if you would like to have that link sent to you, you can also send an email request into the same web address, which is in your packet. So with all of that done, I will turn it over to Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, FirstNet Town Hall. Normally, Karen Wong, the Assistant Director for Public Safety Communications and the State of California's point of contact for FirstNet, First Net, would be participating today. Uh, unfortunately, she had a previous speaking commitment at the uh, Cybersecurity Symposium Sacramento. I am filling in for Karen. Uh, my name is Bill Anderson. I'm the manager for California's 911 uh, Emergency Communications Branch. As we mentioned, today is the third town hall for FirstNet to get information out about where FirstNet is going to be and how it's going to impact you. There are two additional meetings coming up next week. One is going to be in Santa Ana on September 30th. That will be a town hall meeting. And on October 1st, there will be a California FirstNet uh, board meeting and training session in Diamond Bar. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to thank Don Ryan, Alexandra Benetti, and Marilee Tanner Lynn with Solano County for helping us coordinate today's event. Uh, much appreciated. Our board members today are Mr. Frank Drayton, uh, Fire Chief with the City of Vacaville, uh, Mr. Steve Trepanay, uh, Captain with Fairfield Fire Department, Mr. Joe Alio, uh, Captain with Fairfield Police Department, and Mr. Gary T. Elliott, Jr., Under Sheriff with Solano County Sheriff's Office. Before we go into our speakers, because uh, we do have a very full uh, agenda this afternoon, uh, just want to go over very high level what FirstNet means to us uh, at California. Uh, as mentioned, Karen is the state of uh, California's point of contact for FirstNet. And within that role, Karen is responsible for ensuring California will be fully prepared to work with, fir with FirstNet to guarantee that the national public safety broadband network meets the needs of California's first responders. Very big task uh, ahead of her that uh, she's well prepared to take on. So what is FirstNet? Uh, in 2012, President Obama signed the Middle Class Tax Relief and Jobs Creation Act. Within that, there were provisions for a nationwide public safety broadband network. Uh, there were $7 billion that are designated to fund this network uh, that are going to be uh, generated from proceeds of spectrum auctions, uh, 20 megahertz of 700 megahertz spectrum was allocated out of the D block. Currently, they're looking at developing network specifications, looking at coverage, and looking at what costs are going to be associated with FirstNet at a nationwide level and also at state levels. Uh, when you look at the nationwide perspective of FirstNet, we're looking at 5.4 million public safety first responders that have to be accounted for. We have over 3.8 million miles, square miles, of terrain we have to accommodate, along with 60,000 public safety agencies. And that's on a nationwide basis. Just in California alone, we have over 200,000 potential first responders that we need to ensure that they have broadband data available to them uh, during an emergency. That accounts for 2,136 public safety agencies, 478 incorporated cities, 111 tribes, and within just in California, 136,000 square miles. That includes urban, rural, and wilderness. 
challenges with FirstNet for California. Obviously, uh, geography and topology are going to be very important. How do we get FirstNet broadband data out across California? Uh, my background is as an RF engineer, and I can tell you from experience trying to push RF coverage out across a state the size of California with the various topography is difficult, so it's going to be a challenge. Uh, looking at who is a first responder and making sure we have a clear description of who sh who's going to have access to this information so they can properly respond to emergencies. Uh, how is the infrastructure going to be designed? Uh, what do we have in the way of infrastructure now that we can use? What do we need to get in the future? Funding. While there's $7 billion in funding available, is that going to be enough to build out a nationwide system? If not, where do we get additional funding? So all those are challenges. As mentioned in video, next generation 911, which is very close to my heart, obviously, is how are we going to incorporate next gen into FirstNet, and how are those two going to work together? So there's just, just a few of the challenges we face in California uh, as a state. Uh, California's FirstNet um, is run by the uh, CalFriend board, uh, made up of 12 members of the Public Safety Communications Agency, along with tribal advisors. Uh, and their job is to develop and design for California a plan to implement FirstNet in California. So we very much appreciate the participation of the audience and California's first responders at meetings like this so we can gather information uh, that we can take back and help develop that system. Uh, once a plan is in place, it's going to go before uh, First, uh, First Net nationwide and the FCC. Once that's adopted, it will go to the California uh, governor's office, uh, Jerry Brown, who will decide if they're going to opt in or opt out of that plan, which means either we go in with a nationwide plan or we opt out and we decide to build our own system, equivalent uh, in specification to what is designed for the nation. So obviously we have a lot of work for us. So what does this mean to us? Uh, everybody here, I assume, is a first responder personnel. Most people probably rely right now on land mobile radio as their main means of communication, voice. But the ability to push out data, broadband data, either applications, pictures, video, uh, building plans during an emergency is going to be critical in defining who needs to respond to the emergency, how many people we're going to need to uh, have at the emergency, and how we should approach that. So obviously having this information available in the future is going to be very critical to uh, California's first responders. With that being said, and as, as I mentioned, we have a very tight schedule, we'll jump right into our presenters today. And our first presenter is going to be Ms. Vicki Lee. Uh, Vicki is the Association Manager and part of the outreach team for the First Responder Network. Uh, FirstNet. Uh, Ms. Lee is also the liaison to FirstNet's Public Safety Advisory Committee. Ms. Lee has over 17 years of experience with the International Association of Police Chiefs. As program manager for IAFC, Ms. Lee's por portfolio includes programs that focus on collaborative work with other national fire and emergency services organizations such as the International Association of Firefighters, the National Fire Protection Association, and the Congressional Fire Services Institute. Ms. Lee led several projects that brought together representatives from these organizations and others to develop reports, training programs, and other work products for fire and emergency services. Ms. Lee has a bachelor's degree from the College of William and Mary, a master's degree in public administration from George Mason University, and is a certified project management professional. Ms. Lee? Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Thanks very much for having me here. I am uh, based out of Bend, Oregon, so it was a quick trip and it's a lot warmer here than up in Oregon. It's already getting cool. So today, FirstNet uh, Bill did a great job providing some background, but I just wanted to give you a little bit more. Uh, FirstNet is the last recommendation from the 9-11 Commission report <laughs> stating that we needed to have a nationwide broadband network. And so in 2011, all of these organizations were working on the deep block le uh, legislation to reallocate the spectrum. And in 2012, as Bill mentioned, the legislation was signed by the president and our mission is to build, deploy, and operate the nationwide public safety broadband network. 
Bill highlighted several of these things with the funding. There were just a couple others. The, the technology that we'll be using is long-term evolution, which is the state-of-the-art technology. On the sustainability component, the seven, uh, the seven billion, of course, which is already allocated, and then the sustainability component, the legislation authorizes FirstNet to, in addition to collecting user fees, we can leverage the excess capacity of the spectrum. So we know that we're not going to be in emergency use all the time with the network completely full. So we will be working, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, working to identify um, partners, one for the build out of the network, but they may also be leveraging the excess capacity. The priority and preemption for public safety would still remain, but this is the way we anticipate being able to make the network sustainable. And on the governance, in addition to the FirstNet board, it's a 15-member board, three are permanent members. The other 12 are on a rotating term, uh, and they all come from public safety and technical backgrounds. And then we also have the Public Safety Advisory Committee, which is a 40-member committee comprised of representatives from public safety, state, local, tribal associations. They serve FirstNet in advisory capacity, really giving us feedback on for example, right now we're working on some public safety grade requirements that came out of NIPSTIC, and so they're providing advice to our technical team on what these requirements look like and helping to prioritize those, those requirements. We know that the network needs to be reliable and resilient. We know that public safety needs to have priority and preemption, and that we have to have access to the applications and broadband services that will improve not just the, the response, but also the health and safety of first responders and the citizens they serve. So this is how we see the current state of communications and public safety. We have non-mission critical data through mobile data, data terminals. We have non-mission critical voice and data on smartphones. And then we have mission critical voice on land mobile radio systems. In the near term, FirstNet will roll out mission critical data. We'll still have non-mission critical voice, the level you get with Verizon or AT&T on your smartphone, but you will have mission critical data on your smartphone. And then we'll have still mission critical voice on land mobile radio. We have gotten a lot of questions. Is FirstNet gonna replace LMR? It is not for the foreseeable future. So we encourage all of our stakeholders to continue to invest in their LMR systems for the foreseeable future. Longer term, it's possible that FirstNet will be uh, the home of mission critical voice, but that won't be until it's been tested and tested and tested again and, and public safety has given its seal of approval on it. So that's a long way off, but this is how we see the long term with mission critical data and voice all running through FirstNet as well as these LTE services, satellites and deployables. I just wanted to give you all an example. This is a great side-by-side um, -side comparison of response the way it is now and response as we envision it with FirstNet. This is a, uh, just a description of the, the dispatch for the West Texas fertilizer plant fire last year. So this is how it, how it, how it goes now. Hey child, West Fire, the uh, West Fertilizer, is uh, one of their mills is on fire. There's uh, heavy smoke coming out of the top of it. Hey, I was just about to do that. And this is how we envision a response like that dispatch and response with FirstNet. That video was taken by a gentleman who was driving by the plant as it exploded, was uploaded to YouTube within a few minutes. During dispatch, in a, in a first net launch era, this would be uh, transmitted to all the, uh, the units responding to that, to that incident so they'd have a better picture of what they were getting into when they arrived on scene. In addition, we'd have satellite images with the diagrams of vulnerable facilities in and near the, the incident area so they could evacuate and do what they needed to do to protect the surrounding area. We'd have the material safety data sheets for any potential known or possible hazardous materials in the area to protect the responders and citizens in the area. 
And then we'd have other images that would show utility overlays and other tools that the first responders can use to clear searches and, and do what they need to do to ensure that, that the citizens are out, that the scene is secure. You can tell just from these images a lot more, a bigger, a more complete picture for the responders, which again will enhance their response effectiveness and the safety both of the responders and the citizens. So just touching on these slides, uh, we will be covering uh, the areas where public safety needs it. So we'll be using a combination of technologies, not just terrestrial technology, but also satellite and deployables to ensure that we cover all of these areas. We know that most of the population is not in the dense urban area. They're going to be uh, mostly suburban, rural, and wilderness areas. So we'll be working with our technical team and with our partners to develop whatever uh, technologies we need to ensure that we have co coverage where public safety needs it. Just a recap on our roadmap summary, which was released in 2000, March of 2014. I'll be talking about the public notice and comment here and the uh, request for a comprehensive network proposal here shortly. But we, those are our four goals on the roadmap, and we have begun work on two, three of those, the formal state consultations. We began initial state consultation with Maryland at the end of July. Minnesota's initial consultation meeting is going on today. We have several more scheduled through the end of the year. So we are um, making great progress on our roadmap. So I'm not sure how many of you were able to watch the FirstNet board meeting last week. We did have a couple technical difficulties with our ISP provider at headquarters in Ruston. But um, we, the board discussed and rolled out a request for information, as well as a public notice. And I'll, uh, again, get into details here shortly. But essentially, we are looking for those two documents and the comments received during that process to inform our draft request for proposal that we anticipate releasing in early of next year. So we have all of our consultations going on at the same time. We'll have the comments coming in for the request for proposal and the public notice and comment. And then those will all feed in again to the comprehensive RFP, the draft release in March. And then um, the public comment notice will also help inform our policies and procedures going forward. On the public notice and comment, uh, this was just released today in the Federal Register. So it's a 30-day uh, response period that we have. The comments will be due back by October 24th, and all of these comments will be made public on www.regulations.gov. So what this is an, an attempt to do is to define the outer boundaries of certain elements of our enabling legislation. We have provided some proposed interpretations of the legislation that we have questions about, and we encourage associations, individuals, uh, I'll go through everybody else, pretty much anybody can respond to this public uh, notice and comment, but we really are looking for feedback from public safety stakeholders in particular on what, what, how, how we define users, what, define, what, is, what does rural mean, and I'll, I'll go through again some examples here shortly, but that is really what we're going to do to find the outer boundaries, and then taking that information, FirstNet will work to narrow those boundaries in setting up its internal policies. And again, just back on the outer boundaries that this public notice and comment will inform. So again, in addition to the eligible users and the definition of rural, there's some discussion about fees, existing infrastructure sharing, and then the, the network elements including the core and the RAN. The, the public safety users is of particular notice to our, our public safety stakeholders, of course. We are looking right now at defining the public safety users as primary, which would be all public safety, and then secondary, which is a different type of user than what we know in this industry, where it would be sort of your tiered priority. In, in, our, in our definition, which is in the public notice, it's more about our partners, our network partners, and, and they would be the secondary users. And then we have an other user category that might be the states that opt out or that might be um, companies or entities that are leveraging our infrastructure. And all of this is detailed in the public notice. I'm just giving you some highlights. And again, any individuals, public safety entities, associations, state, local, tribal governments, anybody and, and, and everybody is really encouraged to respond. I'll say, too, on the public notice, you are not required to respond to all of the elements, just the ones that interest you. In a parallel process, we have this request for information. The 30-day period is a little bit shorter because the Fed Biz Ops notice was posted last Thursday. So the RFI responses are due on October 17th. 
And these will be confidential. We are really looking for innovative solutions and recommendations and ideas from the possible vendor, for the, for the, the pool of uh, vendors out there. So we want to ensure that they feel comfortable sharing that with us. Obviously some proprietary information would be included. So those will be kept confidential, but again we will use those responses to inform our draft RFP development as we will do on the uh, public notice and comment as well. We did issue several RFIs last year again relating to devices, RAN, core, uh, those were public and we didn't uh, get quite as much information, you know, of course they were protecting their information. So it was very, very broad solutions that came out of that RFI. And so again, we're looking to get, a, drill down a little bit deeper into the, the possible solutions that vendors have to offer. This is a timeline. We'll have, uh, we developed the, the RFI and the, the SU, which is the statement of objectives. There are 15 objectives, uh, pretty easy read. So I'd encourage you to go to our website and just take a look at that. We had our board meeting in September and released the RFI and the SU. And then we'll be reviewing through the end of the year, reviewing those RFI responses and using that to build the draft RFP, which will come out in early next year. We will also, should mention the industry day, we'll, we'll be meeting with vendors to talk about different ideas and solutions and things like that after we've had a chance to process the RFI comments. Just a brief outline of what the RFI looks like. It's pretty lengthy, so just a highlight of the introduction, background, the approach, and then questions related to certain uh, objectives and then instructions and then the uh, reference materials in the appendices. These are some examples of what's included in the RFI. These are pretty Again, pretty key questions that would interest our public safety community, uh, namely priority and preemption. We've got the provisioning, customer care, of course, um, and then the pricing packages, which we know is a big question. We know that this, this network and the, and the services and, and devices that we offer need to be, be competitive with what you are using today. So that's a pretty key component. And then how we integrate all the infrastructure from our state, local, federal, and tribal partners. So the key outcomes, again, primarily just to drive the, uh, get information from our stakeholders to drive the development of that RFP. We're thinking that we may, there may be some responses that come back that help us um, answer questions we didn't even know we had. So it should be a really, really good process for us in terms of getting um, input from the maximum stakeholder community uh, that we've not been able to reach until, until this time. Just a little bit on outreach, what we've been doing, we uh, have been focusing a lot on the National Association conferences and other speaking engagements. We really focus heavily on our online presence, so we launched our website back in March. I encourage you to visit the resources page. There are lots of fact sheets for all the public safety disciplines as well as elected officials, a fact sheet on the differences between LMR and LTE and why you still need to maintain your LMR systems. Board meeting materials and worksheets, our board materials, our, our boards or our board meetings are webcast through the website. And then we're also expanding our social media presence on Twitter, uh, Flickr, LinkedIn. We just launched a YouTube site and uh, yeah, it's been really fun. We tweet quite a bit and we also are blogging uh, pretty frequently on our, on our website as well. Really trying to highlight all the outreach we're doing, where, where our different outreach team members are going, the types of audiences are speaking to, questions that come up and things like that. I mentioned the Public Safety Advisory Committee. We engage them very regularly, and as I mentioned, they've provided a lot of great input, not just on the public safety grade requirements that I told you we're talking with them about now, but they've also helped inform uh, the development of the, um, the eligible users component of that public notice, and they also have provided input on human factors, some of the ergonomic elements related to new technologies and how public safety personnel that would then do their job integrating those technologies. We talk with the, uh, the executive committee holds a meeting once a month and the PSAC meets in person twice a year and then has quarterly meetings in between those in-person meetings. We've recently stood up two working groups, one on tribal um, issues and another on early builder issues, again, really to help uh, FirstNet understand how to really effectively engage the tribal nations throughout this process. And then on the early builder, we really want to understand as our BTOP, as the BTOP entities are going through with their network development, what challenges and what uh, issues they're running into, what the good things are, what the bad things are, just so that we can use that uh, to build our network as well and not make the same mistakes. On the regional structure, as I mentioned, we've really focused a lot on the national meetings. 
because of the limitations of our staff. We're, we're growing very quickly, though we have a little over, um, I think oh, close to 200 staff and contractors now. And our goal is to set up 10 regional teams. We have three of those lead positions advertised right now and we'll be filling out the rest of those regional leads before we fill in the teams. But essentially what we want those regional teams to do is focus on the state, regional, and local meetings that we know that we're missing right now. So these teams would be teleworking. Uh, not all of them may reside in the same city or state, so as long as they're living and working in that region, that's the area that we anticipate them them focusing on. We know that they have the contacts, they know all of you, they work with you day in and day out, and so we know that we can rely on those teams to really help us get the word out and, and drill down to the local level. Uh, we also have a federal team based at headquarters, and a, as a, we have a tribal team lead there too. Uh, some of you may know Carl Rebstock, he came out of Washington. Uh, he's heading up our tribal team, and we have a gentleman named Chris Algier heading up our federal team. And they, they too will be having another, uh, a few other employees uh, working under them as well for those uh, federal and tribal strategies. On state consultation, I mentioned Minnesota's initial consultation is going on today. Just to highlight uh, what the areas, of, what the legislation requires for state consultation, users, infrastructure, towers, that kind of thing, training. So just wanna highlight those for you. And then let you know we'll be covering all of these in the initial consultation meetings as well as throughout the process. We'll have more than just the one meeting. It's an iterative process and we'll be working very closely with the state's team to develop the state plan that will eventually uh, be sent up to the governor. We will talk about roles and responsibilities, critical information and data. We wanna make sure that we're not asking you to collect information that we don't need or aren't gonna use. And this plan development will also be iter iterative. In Maryland, we had, again, some great lessons learned. Uh, the, just to highlight the attendees, the governor was there, broadband team, some public safety folks, FirstNet general manager and some of our staff were there. And then you can see the agenda topics, a state update, and we talked about users, coverage, outreach, and then what the, pro what the actual process looks like from start to finish. It was a very, very busy day. We'll be using uh, not just what happened in Maryland, but in Minnesota, and then we have Oregon and Washington coming up. We have Iowa coming up through the end of the year. All of these initial consultation meetings will just help us improve the process to make sure, again, that it's as effective as possible for your state when we come to see you. We evolved the agenda. You can see that it was, um, uh, we first start out with a state presentation. We've decided we'll start out with a FirstNet presentation so that the state understands uh, what, where FirstNet's perspective is coming from um, and make sure, again, that we're not duplicating efforts with the state presentation and FirstNet's presentation, too. What, one of the key things that we did learn, um, there was in Maryland, there was a battalion chief from Baltimore County who talked about the Preakness, the horse race that's part of the Triple Crown and what the impacts are on the public safety system when there's this huge influx of people into the area and what the limitations of the communication systems are. So what we realize is that we need more public safety officials at the table. So that is one thing that we'll, that we'll be really encouraging the states to do. Um, is making sure that there's a diverse representation of public safety at the table. Again, the Preakness uh, users. Uh, Maryland's a, very unique in that it houses a lot of federal uh, buildings, workers, infrastructure, so that's a consideration. And the federal integration in Maryland, for example, is pretty important. Cybersecurity, of course. This is just the uh, status of our, our state consultation right now. Again, we've uh, done the one in Maryland. Minnesota's going on today. The uh, uh, tan colored states are the ones that will be conducting their initial consultations uh, through the end of this calendar year. And then we have 25 initial consultation checklists that have been returned. Our team is going through those checklists, providing feedback to the states. And we're not pushing the states to turn it in by a certain day. Obviously, we're missing a few of them. We've got 25 turned in. But we really want the states to go at their own pace, whatever level they're comfortable with. We just don't want to rush them. Um, everybody's at a different, different pace. And so we're helping them, guide them through the completion of that checklist as, as they ask for our assistance. How to get involved. Again, this RFI and the public notice and comment, really, really important. I encourage you to take that back to your home jurisdictions and let everybody know that we're really, really, really wanting all of that good input and feedback. 
I would encourage you to contact your state point of contact, Karen Wong. She can give you an update like she's doing here on all the state activities, or as Mike will do too, um, on what's been going on in California related to FirstNet. Feel free to call me, email me at any time. As I mentioned, I'm an association manager, so I focus on the local level. But my colleague, Christy Wild, some of you may know her, she focuses on the states. And then our new state and um, our state lead out of headquarters is Jeremy Zolo. He's very excited about meeting all of the, the state reps and the governance teams in each state. And then again, really just focusing on, uh, on our resources. We update that website. And every day, I encourage you to go to your Twitter feeds and LinkedIn. Uh, TJ Kennedy, the general manager, posts a lot of updates on his LinkedIn page um, and has a good following. So just a lot of good, good fast, fast moving. You know? So um, the social media has really helped with that in terms of making sure, I mean, literally minute by minute, especially as the board meeting was rolling out last week, the RFI, public notice, it was really exciting. A lot of, a lot of good things come, coming out. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Vicki, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to open this up at this time to uh, members of our panel for any questions they may have of Vicki. I have a quick question. Okay. Um, you talked about the RFP and RFQ process and the RFI process. When do you actually see the construction of the system in this state actually starting? That is a great question. Uh, we get that question a lot, and it really depends on how the consultation process goes and sort of where we are in working with our partners. So we've recognized that we need to have a partner that we will be identifying, um, as I mentioned, as part of this RFP process, which will last throughout probably most of 2015. But that will be running in parallel with the state consultation process, and it will help uh, uh, evolve the consultation process. So once we identify a partner, we will understand what additional things need to come to the table during, again, those several meetings that we'll be having with the state. So it's hard to say when the network will be built. Uh, again, we've been asked to put some dates around that. Um, it's hard to say. It could be a couple of years. We've heard 2016. People are hypothesizing 2016, 2017. But again, it really depends on how we integrate the partner, how soon we're able to do that, and then again, the pace at which each state is running through its consultation process. Thank you. Any other questions? No. So we got one more. Oh. One last question for agencies that are out there in the state that are looking at a major upgrade in their system, $10, $12 million. What recommendations do you have for them so we stay parallel, so we don't build a system that's not going to work with your system? For broadband or LMR? Or for, for both. For both. Um, I would work with the state very closely on that. Um, certainly the LMR is separate and again, I can't emphasize that enough, really, to continue to focus on building and, and upgrading the LMR systems as needed for the mission critical voice. If a, if a local jurisdiction, regional jurisdiction is working on, an, on a broadband network, really coordinate that with the state, again, just to make sure that the investment isn't made and then it doesn't integrate with California's efforts once we get to the stage where we're ready to launch FirstNet. So that, that coordination will be really, really important. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask one question? Sure. When you said the LMR <coughs> will remain as is for the foreseeable future. Um, well, how would you define the foreseeable future? What, um, how many years out are you looking? So there's been testing on, you know, not mission critical voice, but voice over LTE, and that's going well. But we have heard from public safety that it can't be tested. Uh, it has to be tested thoroughly. I mean, nobody's going to run into a burning building, you know, just oh hey, that it works, right? So, um, so we we don't ha again have foreseeable future years. We don't know how many. Could be ten. Could be fewer. But we're just saying that um, if you're due for a system upgrade in the next six months, in the next two years, three years, maybe even five years, to certainly proceed with that because we're just nowhere near close to to launching a mission critical voice system in that capacity, so. Any other questions? Great, Thank thanks you, Bill. Our next presenter is Mr. Michael Boyden with Science Applications International Corporation. Mr. Boyden has over 30 years of experience as a program manager, principal consultant, and senior systems engineer leading cross-functional technical teams in development and delivery of new products and services ranging from 911 to land mobile radio networks. 
Mr. Boyden is a program manager and telecommunications subject matter expert for the State of Oregon's FirstNet Support Services contract. Mr. Boyden is the author of Planning for FirstNet Technical Report, which was used by Oregon and the federal government to educate public safety stakeholders. Mr. Boyden holds a master's degree in public administration from St. Mary's College in California. Mr. Boyden is a certified PMI project manager and registered professional engineer in California. Michael? All right. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, really appreciated Vicki coming uh, to talk to us. Uh, there was the, the voice straight from FirstNet as far as what, what things are happening. Um, what I'd like to do today is she talked about what's happening as, as far as the federal activities associated with this National Public Safety Broadband Network development. We're going to bring it down to the next le level with the state, and the speakers that come after me will keep bringing it down to where you end up probably at the end of the day talking about local level uh, relevant things. First, uh, we'll start out with a vision. We're just beginning out on this, this long road here, and so you need to have a vision of where you're going to end up. So I'll be talking a lot about the art of the possible. In, in fact, um, well, let me just kind of finish on the, on the topics here. Uh, we'll talk about, just as Vicki provided you, how FirstNet is structured at the federal level. We'll talk about the analogous uh, structure here in California, how we'll interact between the two. And then we'll actually talk about the future as it's happening now. We're one of the very few states that actually has what's called an early builder activity in the, in the area of LA RICS. And so we'll talk about how we're doing broadband planning, design, and implementation uh, for uh, high-speed wireless networks for public safety right here in the state. And finally, I'll bump it back up to uh, California. And as Vicki had described about the outreach process, we'll talk about what's happening there for California and, and uh, then close. Okay, the vision. Vision is to provide emergency responders with the first nationwide high-speed wireless broadband network dedicated to public safety. I emphasized each of those words uh, for a reason. We'll talk more about those, but for right now, I'd like to just kind of provide a few, uh, I guess, futuristic scenarios. Imagine this. Imagine the law enforcement officers viewing live video from monitoring cameras inside a school while traveling en route to address a school uh, emergency in their police vehicles. Imagine paramedics. One of our emphasis is for this particular town hall is emergency services. So imagine paramedics sending video of patient and vital health stats to the emergency room from the ambulance en route to the hospital. And uh, some of our speakers that, that follow here will be talking uh, about how that's happening today. Uh, imagine uh, right now it feels like uh, most of California is aflame with the different wildfires. Um, imagine an, an incident command center being alerted immediately to a downed firefighter via a helmet camera transmitting real-time video and aware of the dangerous surroundings and vital signs via clothing, heat, and bio-mounted sensors. Um, all those scenarios have a certain assumption in common. A foundation of, foundational assumption is that all those uh, applications are made possible by a high-speed wireless data network, just like the one that FirstNet will be building for us. I um, want to talk a little bit about what that offer is. Uh, what will the federal folks be doing for us in when, they, when you talk about FirstNet? The act, as you heard from, from Bill and Vicki, starts out with providing $7 billion to build the network. It provides the 20 megahertz of spectrum at the 700 megahertz bandwidth. Um, that uh, chairman, uh, one of the board members, uh, Chief Jeff Johnson, calls the linebacker of spectrum. And that's for good reason. That's because of its uh, propagation and penetration capabilities. If you were to take that uh, spectrum and say they had given us something up where Sprint's at, like a two and a half gigahertz, uh, you'd need to build 13 to 15 more cell sites to provide the same coverage as one cell site at the frequency level we've been given. In fact, uh, the value of that spectrum a few years ago at auction, almost worth uh, $3 billion. So that's a valuable asset that's been given to public safety. The third thing that Vicki mentioned is that, for me, this is kind of unusual, but the act, act, legislation often talks about the end goal uh, that you need to accomplish, but this one talks about the how and actually specifies the technology. In the act, they require that in building this network, we use a particular protocol, the long-term evolution LTE 4G tech, uh, technology. This is the same technology that's an international standard being right now rolled out, and you've heard all the commercials from Verizon to AT&T, that the commercial, uh, what you got in your smartphones uh, if you're in an urban area today. Now, there's a real advantage to that. Not only the uh, economies of scale, bringing the cost down because you're addressing a wide, wide international base, but also 
there's the uh, sheer technology advantage. It's going uh, from 3G to 4G is like, uh, is there actually an increase of 10 times the data bandwidth. It allows you to do things that frankly aren't possible right now. Um, you're kind of going from the uh, garden hose to the fire hose in terms of capacity. You'll be able to do with this 4G technology things like one-way, two-way video, high-definition video, things you just can't do today in the network. Um, kind of going down to that bottom right square there, the other thing, and I want to make this clear, is what's happening here is this is a cellular data network. What's happening is they're creating a not-for-profit wireless telephone company within the Department of Commerce. And so what you've got associated with that will be a nationwide network that will have the ability to, uh, you'll be ordering services uh, like you might from Sprint online. You'll get devices and, and you'll be able to uh, you know, have the different features based on, on your needs. You'll also have the ability to have local control. That's also specified by the Act. So although it's a nationwide network, you'll have the ability to do things like shape the traffic in terms of who's going to get what sorts of bandwidths when in a particular scenario. You'll be able to actually do a little bit of uh, what I call blue force tracking. You'll know where all those devices are, and so if they're in a vehicle, if they're on someone's hip, you'll have situational awareness that comes as part of the network. Finally, the most important thing is the top right, the applications. Um, at the outset, what it's basically doing is providing you what you get today if you're using commercial services like a Verizon or an AT&T to uh, do public safety data, but this will be dedicated. So when the teenagers come or, uh, and download their videos when they get home from school or when you're at a stadium and all of a sudden everyone uh, clicks on their cell phone to do the same uh, YouTube thing, your network will remain unaffected. It's on a separate frequency and you'll have that dedicated uh, frequencies when you need it. Okay, what I'd like to do now, Paul, is we can run a video is I wanna take that vision just one more step here. Um, kind of watch it, particularly if you're able to some of the words that go by here, and we'll, we'll talk about what's happening. 10582, they're looking for a DUI motor on Adam Deck 7. Sam 582, 25th Street and Sylvia. I've got a brown Ford Ranger pickup. At the scene of an incident, you need information. This job requires you to be connected at all times. The First Responder Network Authority, or FirstNet, will build a network to give you the connectivity you need to make life-saving decisions. FirstNet is working to put the most advanced technologies at your fingertips. Access to a reliable broadband network will connect you to databases to get the valuable information you need. FirstNet will also connect you to other law enforcement partners. Whether operating on a multi-agency incident or simply sharing data in your own department, FirstNet will bring law enforcement and other public safety disciplines together like never before. We need a broadband network that can be built to mission critical standards. We need a network that can survive a natural disaster and that won't be subject to problems of commercial overload. In short, we need you. We need first step. It's uh, that simple. We stand ready here at the NYPD to assist you any way we can. I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues at Major City Chiefs and at the IACP that we stand shoulder to shoulder willing to support you. First responders need the very best tools we can put in their hands. First responders need FirstNet. Find out more at www.firstnet.gov. Um. What the, the vignette was, was basically uh, the equivalent of taking OnStar star technology, like nine, next generation 911, and putting it on your cell phone. And so what the scenario was, was an accident happened, and the cell phone called 911 and brought the emergency uh, dispatch of the ambulance, um, and then used uh, broadband data all the way in through the... Uh, not only through the ambulance, but right into the, uh, the operating room. And uh, like I say, we'll, we'll provide some scenarios here with some of the other speakers. But here's some of the things that will be provided in terms of op applications, again, made possible by that high, high speed bandwidth. Uh, what I was just mentioning, there's the live one-way, two-way video. Um, there's gonna be all sorts of medical telemetry. Uh, Carl from AIR will be uh, talking about, you know, just some of that types of data that you'll be able to um, transmit. Large files, things that will become uh, possible when you can bring a floor plan with you, uh, when you can download high-resolution high uh, images and things like that, and um, Barry will talk more about that as well. All right, let's talk about how to get there, uh, leveraging off what Vicki described on the, on the federal level. 
Um, on the federal level, uh, she had described that there's this first net managing organization, this 200 members strong, this telephone company that's being built. Um, they re uh, report to a board. Uh, she had mentioned the board member or board meeting was last month. Um, there's the folks on the board, and, and they range from the typical um, uh, badges, bandages, and, and hoses. There's a police, fire, emergency medical, and there's also technologists, folks that are experienced in building uh, LTE networks, data networks, um, typically from uh, wireless carriers. In California, as Bill mentioned, our analogous uh, structure is the uh, California First Responder Network Board, CalFERN. Uh, that's the, the item in the middle. That's going to be our governing body. I'll talk more about that. Um, other important pieces in the legislation, as, as was mentioned, is at the governor's office. The governor has that decision once FirstNet designs, creates a design for the state and tells us how much it will cost. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to make that decision from the governor's office whether to opt in or opt out. Um, governor also had the responsibility of a, assigning a point of single point of contact for the state. As we mentioned, that's Karen Wong um, in the Office of Emergency Services. That'll be the, creates that communication conduit that, that I'll describe here that allows us to provide feedback and, and input to the stakeholder process. Here's our board. Uh, they meet every couple of months. And uh, let's see, I know Barry is here. Who else is a CalFern board member that's here today? I think Barry is our designated person here. Um, he's from the Bay Area, and you'll hear more from him. But we've got, just like the ones at the federal level, the, the same uh, law enforcement, uh, fire services, emergency medical professionals, plus more. There's a lot of stakeholders that are get involved in, in public safety. And for example, we have representatives from the, the tribal, uh, the governor's tribal uh, advisor. And uh, Dory will be talking a little bit about that here later on in the, in the afternoon. Um, the committee is going to have a lot of decisions to make and going to need a lot of input because we're getting a network. But the question is not then, well, who's going to use the network and who's going to get a device and what happens in an emergency? How do you, uh, depending on the particular scenario, who gets the highest uh, priority and can, you know, everybody can't send a video all the time in a single cell sector, so it's going to have to decide, well, which ones uh, pass through? Well, we've set, set up already the arms and the legs of the committee in terms of uh, subcommittees, and, and some of them are very familiar to you. There's the California Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee, CalSeq, uh, State 91 Advisory Board, uh, so very familiar with those. But also we're establishing new ones, such as the Tribal Advisory Committee, and uh, in particular the uh, Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, there's the place where we're going to meet with, uh, you know, have the ability to take the technologists that come from FirstNet, meet those with California's needs, and decide how to move forward in this highly technical um, uh, release here in terms of a network. How does this all work together? Well, you got FirstNet, you got our single point of contact, you got the board, and then you got us. And, and what will happen here is that uh, the uh, FirstNet will communicate information, just as you heard from Vicki, through our single point of contact and, and work with the board in one direction. The other direction, though, is they'll be asking for a lot of input that will come from the stakeholders, and we'll be collecting that through our board members. So it's real important for you to, to know your, your board member and be able to do that communication, and when they ask for stuff, to be able to provide it so that we get that input. And I'll talk more about that uh, in, a, in a minute here. Um, all right, let's talk now about what's happening right now here in California. Um, the Los Angeles Regional Interoperable Communications System Joint Powers Authority, or LA RICS. Um, this is a, an authority that supports uh, Los Angeles County. It's got 81 public safety agencies and over 34,000 first responders and is serving over a 4,000 square mile area. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, if you look at our neighbors to the north in Oregon, the entire state has about 20,000 first responders. So this is a terrific proven ground for, for doing something here and learning from it. Um, the, what's happening now for LA RICS is actually have like a, a double threat here. They're not only uh, working on building a LTE, long-term evolution network for data traffic, they're simultaneously upgrading their land mobile radio networks. Um, what had happened was they had received a grant uh, they call them uh, BTOP, Broadband Technologies Opportunities Program Grant from NTIA, that's an administration within the Department of Commerce, before FirstNet Act had been established in 2012. 
And so what happened was the act established and they said everybody that got one of those grants, stop. Um, and then one by one, they looked at them individually, decided which ones would go forward in advance of FirstNet and called them early builders. LA Ricks was one of those and there's probably about only a half a dozen of those that made it through. So at this point in time, fast forward to now, uh, they've got funded, uh, awarded um, initiatives for, um, let's see, about $280 million, um, 205 for, for building and 75 for maintenance for land mobile radio. And then for on the LTE side, there's $175 million allocated to be spent to be, be building networks. Um, for the land mobile ra radio network, uh, we're talking about 88 sites. And what I want to, the reason I've got this up here for our discussion, though, is I want to point out that they're building these two networks simultaneously, but they're only going to use 40 of the sites for land mobile radio for LTE. Doesn't seem cost effective, but I want to explain why they are. Um, land mobile radio uh, technology is fundamentally different, the push to talk radios, fundamentally different than a cellular technology like LTE. If you uh, have a land mobile radio system like the, the box on the top there, what you do is you, if you're building it, you want to put it up on a high site, have a really tall tower, use lots of power and transmit 20, 40 miles out, and have relatively high power receivers, you know, 5 watts to maybe even up to 100 watts. You know, talk about vehicular types of things. Totally different with uh, LTE. With LTE, it's cellular, so by definition, we're talking small. And we're talking uh, antennas that you see, like you see like on the side of a building perhaps, much lower because you have a one to five mile radius for a cell site. And you have very, because of that, you have very small, uh, low power uh, receivers. We're talking maybe a quarter of a watt. So as you can tell from this, if you were to take one of those cells and co-locate it on top of that mountain, well, you'd light up the mountain with LTE service pretty well, but it wouldn't be very useful for, for where you need it. So what LA, uh, LA did is, is doing LA Ricks is they're ending up with over 200 sites and um, they're in some, uh, like I say, widely different places just dependent on those different heights and that, that sort of coverage. Let's talk about uh, their deployment and then we'll, we'll move on. Um, the uh, land mobile radio has a five phase uh, deployment process. Um, right now we're uh, we're going in, uh, we're in the design going in, to, we'll be starting into construction. That'll start, um, let's see, into, uh, well, you end up with system implementation ranging from next year in the fall for a couple of years, and then rolling in about 2018 to system maintenance. If you look at LTE, what you're doing there, you got, remember you got twice as many sites, their uh, schedule is basically we got to start now and we got to be done by this time next year. And the reason is, is because they got their grant monies about five years ago from next year, and so they'd expire. So there's a real race to the finish in LA to, um, to make this thing happen. Um, the um, thing about it, though, is from our perspective as, as a state and in other areas, is that um, when this is up, there'll be over 200 sites, and it will actually be the um, largest public safety network in the US until FirstNet gets widely deployed. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to get lessons learned, find out what works, what doesn't work. Um, they've actually been given certain things as part of their grant that they have to research to make sure that uh, they, um, uh, well, again, what works and what doesn't work. And so we'll be taking advantage of all that information. Okay, let's talk about uh, where we go from here. Um, I want to try to pick up on where uh, um, Vicki left off. California received funds uh, from a different grant to do what we're doing right now. We're performing uh, outreach, which is two steps. The idea is to get the word out that this is happening from the federal level because we'll be interested in your information to be able to inform the building of this network to make it useful. Um, California Office of Emergency S Services has that responsibility under Karen Wong. And uh, what we're doing right now is analogous to what Vicki described having a series of town halls, uh, we'll be going to conferences, and the uh, primary thing I want to mention here is we have all sorts of materials. So um, if uh, the core team, can you guys raise your hand, like, like Hector and, and Juliet way in the back there, um, Joni is saying there's, these are folks that you met them as you came in. Contact them if you have any questions or any opportunities, if you have a particular group, peer group that you want to talk to, you want us to get the word out to. Okay, this was a, a, a simple diagram that Vicki had in the little top corner of her slide. <laughs> By law, the 
Act says that the federal uh, first net organization must consult with the states when they do their design. They can't just build it and say, here you go. This is how they've decided to do it. It's a 46 step process and we're not gonna go through the, the details, but I just wanna point out that at the end of it, uh, state activities are in the center, is uh, that plan to the governor. But if you look at the columns on the top, that's where I'm interested in looking at, is what it really amounts to is an iterative design process. It's like a spiral uh, design approach if you were doing software. What'll happen is there'll be a, a preliminary design and they'll have a consultation meeting with the state and say, well, here's what we think. What do you think? What's missing? What's, uh, what needs to be added? They'll then come back and go work on that, come back again, and so forth, until that final design, the final state plan is presented to the governor with not only the um, design itself and the coverage areas, but also the costs. If people are asking, well, how much does it cost? Uh, what FirstNet says is, well, it's, it's going to be a, a, at a cost that's compelling. And so <laughs> what does that mean? Practically speaking, if you're already using a commercial carrier, it's going to mean at or below what you're doing now. And you've got to remember, this is not just best effort service. This is dedicated service. So, so there's a value proposition there as well. Okay, so what will happen is we'll have those consultation processes. You saw the detail that Vicki had provided. That's... Um, She's talking about this one happening right there. So that's where we're at. Right now in, this, uh, in the fall here, next month or so, California will be finishing their materials for the readiness checklist, and then we'll drop into queue. It'll start probably next year after they do the beta sites. Um, so we got a ways to go. Uh, she talked about the RFP responses. That's running in parallel. Uh, you had a question about the timing of this. Uh, I agree with Vicki. They're gonna have to do the RFP next year get that information out before you can start finishing the design and being able to understand what the costs are. Because the whole goal of this is the ultimate opt-out is not the governor's decision, but your decision. Because this will be presented to you when FirstNet delivers service in your area, and you'll have the opportunity to stay on their AT&T or Sprint or Verizon if you're using that for data service, or go to FirstNet. So indeed, it's got to be compelling or, or it's not going to happen. Okay, I just want to kind of close here with a little bit of a preview of that design process so you get a feel for it. Um, what they're looking at, as, as Vicki had mentioned, is they kind of call it a three-in-one network. They're expecting to cover about 60% of the geography, and they have to get and cover wherever first responders do their job in the 56 states and territories, about 60% of that with that LTE technology. But you can't have it everywhere. You saw how many towers you need. It's physically not possible, and we certainly don't have enough money. So what they'll do with the three-in-one is where, uh, outside of those particular areas, you'll be able to um, provide access, say, via satellite communications, or, uh, as Vicki mentioned, deployable cell-on-wheel types of technology. You'll bring the network with you. Um, to give you a sense of how that looks like in California, here's something that the Office of Emergency uh, Communications in uh, Department of Homeland Security did as a quick check on some of this. And you can see here that California is a big state. <laughs> and so you're definitely gonna get covered where people are, but there'll be areas that will be having significant uh, rural uh, territories that will have to have you know, the network truck to them, so to speak, or, or beam down. Um, what's important for us, though, in deciding the details of exactly what happens here is providing the information to FirstNet in the coming months when they ask about it, about where our critical infrastructure is. Um, who needs to have this? What coverage areas are important to uh, make sure get uh, placed in the design? We'll have multiple chances to do it. And even after uh, the thing's deployed, uh, Rich Reed of FirstNet has mentioned, who's in charge of the state plans, that it's not over. You can still say, hey, there's a gap here and a gap there. And this is just analogous to what you do when you're a commercial provider. If you're doing cellular, uh, you've, you've noticed they, they roll it out in your area. They say it's there, but there's, there's holes. And then over time, it gets filled in. Same process. But what's going to be important is the local knowledge that you have. Uh, example I like to give is a few years ago back east, um, they would never believe that there'd be uh, a certain time of year, uh, a city the size, the seventh uh, largest city in the state of Nevada, 70,000 people that appears for the Burning Man you know, in the high wow. desert area. Um, that kind of knowledge for California, you know, be it the, the Rose Bowl Parade or a particular critical infrastructures and nuclear power plants, ports, you name it, we're going to have to tell them about that. One of the scenarios uh, we, we found in, in Oregon was that they had talked about, well, we've identified for you 
Uh, here's a prison, you want coverage there. Here's a courthouse, you want coverage there. But what was missing is the fact that uh, folks transport those prisoners to hearings all the time, and so the last thing you need is to have coverage here, a dead spot, <laughs> and then coverage here again when you're in neither of those places. So that's the kind of information that we need to provide them. Uh, just want to wrap on this by saying, if you're familiar with, uh, or at least to me, if, if you're accustomed to working with the federal government for land mobile radio, um, typically what would happen is you would uh, request money, let's say, for a grant, they'd award you the grant, and then you'd use that money as you need to build the network you need. Not so with FirstNet. What's going to happen is they're going to get monies from the t selling uh, TV spectrum auctions in the coming years. They're going to keep the money, and then they're going to ask you what you need. Um, you'll tell them what you need, they'll build it for you, and then charge you a recurring monthly fee. So what happens is there's a shift. Instead of going, I need the money, and make sure you get as much money so you can do what you need to do, the shift will be you need to communicate what where coverage you need and where I need it and why, and make sure that you get, at the end of the day, a design that's useful for you. Okay, just uh, to, to, to wrap here, I want to reiterate what, again what Vicky said, and uh, there was a question here, you know. LTE is not a replacement for land mobile radio systems, so if you have a, an accountant or bean counter or a, a plan there that says, hey, now I don't have to have that budget line item, no, you still need that for your mission critical voice. And a lot of them are coming up right now in, in, in some dire needs for, for renewal. Um, but what you will get with LTE as this rolls out is something that very much complements uh, that voice, and that's going to be the uh, really uh, data, exciting data services that we, we haven't even begun to think about. If you can imagine just five years, six years ago, before a smartphone, what life is and what it's now today, having one, just a dramatic shift, and that's going to be something now that we can also offer in our, fulfilling our mission as public safety uh, first responders. Um, at the end of the day, I wanted to address Joe's comment here with this, this slide. Uh, at the end of the day, this is from uh, uh, Office of Emergency Communications again. Right now we're at that right side, or excuse me, left side of this, and that's where there's a dedicated public safety uh, land mobile radio for voice, and at the bottom, typically you're using commercial for data. We're very rapidly, for example, with LA Ricks coming into here where there's this center thing where we're starting a public safety dedicated broadband network. Now, what's gonna keep you from, you're asking, when will I see uh, the mission critical voice on LTE is this here. Right now in the standards bodies, it's called 3GPP, uh, the International Standards, they're working on pieces that you get today in land mobile radio that aren't in LTE standard. And so there'll be things like uh, the talk around direct mode group communications that people rely on. Those are in standards bodies now, so if you're asking, well, when will that be? You give it like three years, there's about a three year cycle that they use for standards at the international level. Give it another three, four years to get it out in the equipment, and then you can start looking about making deployment plans. So, but to end, to end that conversation, at the end of the day, there's going to be a point where there truly will be interoperable networks, and that will be by definition, because at the end of the day, it will be a single network. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And open it up to the panel for any questions they may have of uh, Michael. I got one real quick. One. What role does the state play in the development of, of the system, um, the, the nationwide system? Yeah, the, the biggest thing, well, uh, from the nationwide perspective, there's actually lots of opportunities. As we mentioned, we have Karen Wong as a single point of contact. There's meetings that they have, um, well, Vicki runs, runs a number of those. Uh, to, uh, are they happening right now that influence and, and direct and advise uh, how the network will be uh, being put together. But on a practical standpoint, for our, our state, the things that I think are going to be the biggest influencer, influencing thing is the things that we can do is the parts that have to do with influencing the design. So what they'll be coming to us and, and asking us for, and the information we'll want to get to the CalFern board, and, and through the single point of contact is they'll be asking us, um, how many users do you have today of your mobile uh, service? How many devices? What they're finding in some of the surveys is uh, they expected, well, you know, at, at home, I, I mean, I got two cell phones with, with me right now. You, you figure, well, maybe it's one and a half devices per person because they got an MDT in the, in the squad car and they got it. Well, 
what happens is uh, the OEC was looking at it and coming up and saying, well, it's, it's maybe about a quarter of a person because what happens is you get stuff reallocated. You have a cache of radios, and when you're off shift, you're not using it. The next guy uses it. So they're going to ask you uh, how many devices you have. Then they'll ask, what are you, you going to use it for? If you're using uh, SMS, text services, very little bandwidth, almost negligible. If you're doing that video, as you saw, in some cases you can't even launch it. And so that kind of information will tell them where and how to do the design. You have questions? Yeah. I have. Um, what, what are some of the challenges you, you see for California moving forward with this? I, I think one of the biggest challenges for us is we're big, like I mentioned. Our, I saw an article, we're a $2.2 trillion economy. We're bigger than Russia or Italy. Um, and so we're almost, uh, hesitate to use the word, but it's almost like a federation. <laughs> You've got very different needs in different areas. And so, for example, um, Vicki mentioned, you know, she's going to have a consultation. I'll be there in, in uh, Oregon next month. Well, for California, we, we can't get by with a single. We're going to need probably two, three of them just to be able to cover it. So I think one of the biggest challenges is just be the breadth of bringing together what's really a rich and, and uh, vibrant economy and the public safety environment that supports it into this, this uh, network process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Okay, our next presenter is gonna be Mr. Barry Frazier. Uh, as Michael mentioned, Barry's a member of the California <laughs> First Responder Network, uh, CalFriend Board. Barry is also general manager of the Bay Area Regional Interoperability Communication Systems Authority, Bay Ricks. Is responsible for management and administration of Bay Ricks, the joint powers authority established to govern, to govern regional public safety communications in San Francisco Bay Area. Mr. Fraser was responsible for the development of BayWeb, a regional wireless broadband network for public safety use, and coordination of other advanced regional public safety communication systems. Mr. Fraser serves as a board member for California First Responder Network, CalFRIN, uh, committee chair for Public Safety Homeland Security Committee, for the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, and a member of FirstNet's Public Safety Advisory Committee. Mr. Fraser received his Juris Doctor degree from the University of San Diego School of Law and is a member of the California Bar Association. Barry? Thank you. And thank you all for uh, coming today and uh, allowing me to talk a little bit about um, FirstNet and broadband data for public safety. Um, I. Uh, I'm the general manager of a uh, regional joint powers authority called the Bay Area Regional Interoperable Communication System Authority, also known as BayRix, which serves uh, the, uh, the area here. So the BayRix Authority is a 12-member joint powers authority uh, established in August of 2011. Uh, includes the counties and, and some of the cities and, and the state of California uh, that are uh, in the Bay Area. And um, we, were we, we were established uh, primarily to oversee a, another BTOP uh, data network project similar to the LA RICS project that you heard about. Uh, and unfortunately, our project uh, did not go forward. But th the good news is that we, now, we still have this governance body that uh, is now set up and ready to respond to uh, FirstNet and to state consultation issues and we intend this board to, to be around uh, when FirstNet is deployed and developed to help manage uh, the local management and control aspects of, of this network. But right now, we're really focused on the state consultation process. And that's really what, why we're here today, is to talk about what we need uh, from a CalFERN perspective from state and from state, local, cities, and counties to be able to do the consultation process. So, oh, there we go. Uh, this is a very basic slide. I think you all know th this information. I, I wanted to focus on the differences between LMR and uh, broadband data. Uh, today, uh, your, your land mobile radios uh, are very reliable. They are used for mission critical communications. But they are, they do tend to be sort of a patchwork quilt of networks. Many jurisdictions have uh, their own um, voice radio networks. And, and we are getting to the point where a lot of this is interoperable, but we still have uh, jurisdictions that are you know, operating separate networks. 
Um, it's also limited in bandwidth. And it really doesn't work for data. On the broadband data side, most of you today are using commercial self-service, uh, smartphones, uh, air cards, those types of things. Now, broad commercial self-service is highly interoperable. It's one network, covers everyone. So you can communicate with, with virtually anyone else on the network. Uh, but it's not hardened for public safety, doesn't tend to be reliable in emergencies, and it's not mission critical, not acceptable for mission critical. And when you see uh, large incidents, especially uh, back east, when you see the hurricanes and the, the strong storms that come through, the commercial cellular networks uh, tend to go down. Uh, and so that, that's a drawback for using commercial cell service. So FirstNet is going to be a broadband data network, secure private network exclusively for public safety. It will be the first nationwide wireless network for local public safety users. And you need to think about that. The first nationwide network for local public safety users. How is that going to work? Uh, well, that, that's part of why we're here today, is to try, to try to get some information to figure that out. And as all the other speakers have said, it is not going to be a replacement for your LMR voice communications. We're just not there yet. We may be there someday, but we're not there yet. Uh, broadband, high-speed data communications in the field, and think about smartphone apps, think about uh, sharing photos, video, large data files, and that type of thing. That's what we're really talking about here. So this is very important. For, what will FirstNet do for you? FirstNet's going to save time in the golden hour. The first hour after a major incident is the critical time. That's when you save lives. And FirstNet will help, that, help you do that a much better way. It's going to be one network for dispatch and support of EMS, law, fire, personnel, all from different ju jurisdictions. You're all going to be using the same network. So if you share a file, you share video, you're capable of sharing it with anyone that you need to that's responding to the incident. It will allow uh, chiefs and commanders to have local control. What does that mean? It means you can assign and give priority to specific users on the fly. There's a concept that we're looking at called immediate peril or imminent peril. If you've got, someone, if you've got an EMS or a paramedic that's trying to save a life in the field, you can, you can dedicate a large amount of the pipeline, the bandwidth, to uh, saving that life. And you can do that more or less in real time. Uh, you can also assign priority access for applications. If you've got a critical video camera that, that needs to stay on, that everyone needs to see, you can assign priority to that particular camera, that particular application, to ensure that it has the bandwidth to stay up so that your first responders can see what's going on. Uh, and it, it enhances the situational awareness and decision making. Your commanders can have a lot more information to make decisions on how to respond to an incident. Uh, and, and it will allow you to roll out new tools, new applications to support the jobs you do. Now, just, you know, being able to share real-time data, audio and video with hospital staff is going to be incredibly important to saving lives. Uh, for first and foremost, well first, you'll be able to access incident status and possibly medical histories en route to the scene before you get there. Uh, it will improve all phases of pre-hospital care. When you get to the victims, you can help them out. You've got a lot more tools to do it. And it will provide hospitals with advanced real-time information on patient status and immediate needs before the patients get to the hospital. And let me just talk a little bit about how that, that might work. This, this is a slide, um, it's a little confusing. I, I borrowed it from the, from the DOD, but the idea is you can, um, first, you, you, you can use the technology to access uh, patient status and get vital signs, VS, and, and input them into a, a, like a handheld uh, tablet or, or smartphone type of device. And then you can use the wireless technology to transmit that information uh, back to a doctor, back to the hospital, uh, and, and also you can continue to monitor that patient uh, as you go. There, the technology will allow you to do speech recognition, so you don't have to type anything into it. 
you can have a headset on, you can talk about the vital signs, and it will then put them into the tablet. Uh, and then all of this information, you can, you'll have it on a tablet, but that can be transmitted over the FirstNet network back to the hospital, back to the, um, the, the doctors, wherever it needs to go to help you uh, save a life. And just a few other applications that you, we, we, I think you'll be able to see once you get FirstNet developed, uh, you know, two-way video, uh, and, uh, I, you know, this idea of, of, of virtual MD or community par paramedicine where you've got a doctor in a remote location over video who's able to see the, uh, the patient, talk to the patient, talk to the paramedics, uh, and help respond to, uh, to the, the patient's needs. Um, standoff uh, vital signs monitoring. Uh, this is technology that allows you to detect vital signs. Uh, from a distance. You don't have to be right up next to the patient to be able to collect those, those vital signs. And then you can transmit that information over the network to whoever, whoever needs it. Uh, portable CAT scans, portable ultrasound technologies being developed that will allow you to do these, uh, th these procedures in the field and provide information on broken bones, internal, internal injuries, and get, them, get that information back to a doctor who can, who can diagnose what's going on all while you're in the field. Uh, and then a couple of other things. Uh, you, when you get into mass incidents, you may be monitoring a number of different patients in the field at the same time. Uh, and there's technologies being developed that will allow you to see on a screen what's going on with a, a number of different patients and, and detect uh, problems uh, as, they, as they arise. Um, or send this information back to the hospital. And in addition, you can use this for, uh, for responder uh, vital signs monitoring. You've got a lot of firefighters in a hot burning building. You want to pay attention to, the, to their, their, their health status and make sure no one's getting uh, you know, overheated or in, in, in some type of peril. You can monitor these things um, uh, through, through the network. Uh, and then finally, there's the this is really getting into some science fiction, but there's infrared crowd disease detection, which allows you to, uh, which may allow you to uh, to help uh, detect certain diseases uh, in a in a in a, uh, uh, a large scale uh, mass uh, um, uh, pandemic type of situation, uh, and you can do this uh, um, remotely. But the thing is, FirstNet will allow you the capability to do some of these things. That, uh, that, that really aren't possible today um, with, with your current systems. So mm -hmm. first, so what do we need to do to make this happen, right? Uh, the, the law states, the federal law that established FirstNet states that FirstNet will have to work in consultation with federal, state, tribal, and local public safety entities to do these specific things that are, that are spelled out in the law. And that's what we're basically here today to try to begin doing. Um, construction of the network, placement of towers, coverage areas, security, reliability, resili resiliency requirements, selection of entities who can use the network, who, who are the users of the network, uh, assignment of priority, I talked about priority just a little bit, and training needs. The key is that FirstNet needs help from state and local agencies to get answers to these questions. And that's what we're here today to try to, try to start doing. How do lo uh, local, state, and uh, city and counties, how, how, can we, how can we do this? How can we prepare for FirstNet? Well, the first and most important thing to do right now is to engage your stakeholders. And, and we're doing that through these town halls. Um, you have to identify the key decision makers. You have to educate and stay informed. Uh, Vicki Lee talked about the, uh, the public notice and the RFI information that's going out. You, you need to look at these things and need to read them, and you need to understand what, what types of things FirstNet is looking at, what questions they're answering, or they're, what questions they need answers to. And, um, and, and you need to talk about it among the stakeholders. Um, have you identified your users? This is, one, this is one of the issues that is going to be dis, that's discussed in the request for comments, is who can use the network 
and it's critically important to be able to understand who it is. My personal view is that FirstNet needs to set the, the eligible user base as broadly as possible and then allow state and local entities to decide who specifically they, should, they want to have on the network. I feel like that's a local decision, but that's, that, that's not the only viewpoint. There are a lot of different viewpoints, uh, and, and uh, FirstNet has to figure that out and decide how that happens. They can help, you can help by providing input to CalFern and to the state in this consultation process. Um, what's your governance plan? I talked about local control and setting priority. You, local state, cities and counties have to figure out how, to, how they're going to govern that, how they're going to make that work. And, and uh, so you have to figure out who can use a network, who has priority. Uh, you have to figure out identity management. Who, you know, how do you connect the devices with the, the, uh, the people who are using uh, the devices? Um, and then support, training, and exercise. All of these things are, have, will have local, must have local components. And, and we've got to figure out how, how the local viewpoints are going to fit in with the nationwide network. Then there's some other things that we'll probably be collecting. Uh, this is I kind of uh, uh, what I, I call phase two of the state consultation process. But depending on how FirstNet decides to proceed, we may be asking about potential uh, radio sites, potential infrastructure, backhaul that might be available FirstNet can use to build the network uh, to possibly save cost by using what's, what's already available. Um, and then finally, um, it's very important to stay up to speed on things like coverage and capacity issues. Uh, uh, Mr. Boyden talked about the difference between LMR sites and coverage and LTE sites and coverage. It's important to understand those distinctions so you can understand what, uh, what needs to happen to build the network. Uh, how fast is the network? Uh, we all, you know, want the fastest broadband speeds, but there's some things that, uh, that, uh, go into that mix that may determine how fast or how, how uh, quick you get the information through the network. You need to understand some of the technical issues like that. Cost. Cost will, will be the biggest, uh, the biggest determination, determinator of success or failure of this network. Because if, this, if, the, if, if the system costs too much, you're not going to buy it. You're going, to, you're going to buy Verizon or AT&T broadband service, even if it's less reliable. And, and, and so costs are critical. Uh, devices, you know, there will be a whole um, new array of smartphone devices that will be designed for public safety users. And I, uh, Chief, I think you asked about the, 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 uh, how you can plan what you're building right now to, to make sure you have something that's compatible with FirstNet. And I would point out that look at devices and look at devices that potentially, uh, especially if you're looking at upgrading uh, or providing smartphones or tablets to your force, uh, look at things that might be upgradable in the future to uh, automatically migrate over to the FirstNet network uh, rather than having to buy a whole new um, set of devices when FirstNet comes along. I think there are some devices that are, that are, there are some device manufacturers that are starting to look at that. And so you have to pay a close attention to the device market and what's going on. Uh, and then the applications, the things that I talked about. Uh, you, you know, you, you want to keep up to speed on what's going on with applications. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up now. I know you guys uh, want to have a break, uh, but uh, just, you know, for more information, uh, a lot of this has already been, been uh, given out to you. Uh, Firstnet.gov is an excellent website. There's a lot of good information on there, and they're continually updating it on a daily basis. So if you want to find out the latest news or what's going on or get information about status, uh, Firstnet.gov. Um, from the California perspective, um, you know, I, I, I want to make myself available because I'm, also, I'm a member of the CalFern board and also a member of FirstNet's Public Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, you can always contact me uh, through that info at bayricks.net if you have questions. Also on the bayricks.net website, we have a blog where we're putting out information uh, on state happenings and, and uh, FirstNet 
happenings and trying to coordinate that information, uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to look at the, our website whenever you, you need to. But, but the key, I think, really is to stay engaged, participate, and, uh, and ask a lot of questions. And so I'm going to wrap up, and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Barry. Uh, <laughs> do we have any uh, questions from the board? Um, yes, and speaking of broadband, this question was emailed to me from the audience. Um, it sounds like we need to plan for an equipment replacement cycle about seven to ten years from purchases today before FirstNet will be built out and commercially available equipment to use it. Is that correct? Uh, well, so that may not be entirely correct. Uh, FirstNet could, could potentially be de begin to be deployed 2016, 2017. So at that point, you're going to want to look at devices that will operate on the FirstNet network. Those will be smartphones, tablets, data types of devices. The seven to 10 year cycle is gonna be the, the, the point in time when there could be a convergence of the LMR and the LTE networks. So at that point, you might wanna look at devices that will actually do mission critical voice over FirstNet. Um, seven years, that would be the earliest, I think, that we would see that happening. I think it's more seven, seven to, to ten years before we actually get good, reliable, mission-critical voice over uh, an LTE network. But, but you, you're going to need to look at devices like smartphones and like tablets as soon as FirstNet is up and running. And then you will look at uh, perhaps another purchasing round of devices when that mission critical function becomes available uh, over the LTE networks. So that, that's kind of the distinction there. Any other questions? Thank, Thank you, you Barry. And just as a reminder, at the end of our presentations today, we will be opening up uh, to the audience questions of our panel members. Uh, so no cheating and emailing questions to our panel ahead of time, <laughs> even though that was a really good idea. I wish I'd thought of that one. But uh, we're doing well on time, so why don't we go ahead and take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back at uh, 10 till. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next presenter is Ms. Dory Beats. Uh, Dory is the planner and emergency manager for the Tuolumne Band Miwok Indians. Ms. Beats works and lives on the Tuolumne Rancheria in the county of Tuolumne in Central California. As a former councilwoman, Ms. Beats understands the complexities of tribal governments and the need to foster better communication between tri tribes and outside agencies. Ms. Beats is involved in every aspect of emergency management and sits on several tribal organization boards, including the California Indian Forestry and Fire Management Council and the National Tribal Emergency Management Association. Ms. Beats was recently appointed to the Capital Region American Red Cross Director Board of Directors Ms. Beats also worked closely with the County Fire, Law Enforcement, Office of Emergency Services, and Emergency Medical Services so that her tribal community is a partner in preparing for, responding to, or recovering from a disaster or emergency. Outside of her daily work, Ms. Beats is a member of the National Ski Patrol and serves as a first responder to both the Dodge Ridge and Kirkwood Ski Report Resorts, one of my favorite ski resorts to go to, Kirkwood. Um, a show of hands, is there anyone in the room that represents a tribal organization, fire law enforcement? Yes, sir, where are you from? Yay, just right up the road. I'm going to mention you here in a little bit. <laughs> um, anybody that uh, uh, lives and works in a community that has a tribal organization that you know of? Well, there's a few, uh, a little bit more than we had in Bakersfield. Um, well, today what I'd like to talk to you about a little bit is about some California tribal facts. I really... Um, very, very engaged and involved in tribal emergency management, both here in California as well as nationally across the United States. And I want to talk just to, I take an opportunity to kind of educate what's happening uh, uh, here in California with respect to tribes and emergency management. Obviously, I'm here as a member of the governor's uh, uh, tribal advisory to CalFERN, 
And so I want to participate um, as much as I can in educating and also um, both CalFERN as well as those agencies that might be working for uh, towards the deployment of FirstNet here in California. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the sovereignty of a tribe and the relationships that we have and obviously the language that's mandated uh, within the FirstNet um, uh, legislation and law um, that mandates uh, interaction with tribes. I'll talk about some unique challenges and again I'll try to educate a little bit um, about some of those challenges as well as the opportunities and benefits that many local organizations, whether they are fire, law enforcement, emergency services, um, can interact with tribal communities. And so I really want to focus on that as well today. Currently right now, this is a huge map of California. It was stated earlier as 111 tribes. We actually went back um, two weeks ago and double-checked everything. Uh, official word, it's 109 federally recognized tribes in all the state of California. If for some odd reason you are unfamiliar with those tribal communities, I have my address, my um, telephone number, and my email address. Um, I can help you identify those tribal communities in your locale, in your area um, to work with. But one of the things I want to talk about is just historically um, about what, where we're at with respect to emergency management in California. With 109 tribes, one of the biggest issues that we find is location. You'll find a lot of tribal communities in an area that most people are unaware of. And you may not even know about those tribal communities uh, and where they are located. When it comes to emergency services, one of the biggest issues has to do with access. My reservation is about 1,700 acres of land, both fee and trust. Um, there's also in California what they call public domain allotments. But one of the things that we have as an issue is access, getting in and out, one way in, one way out. And so obviously when it comes to emergency services in the event of a fire or disaster, we have some pretty unique issues that other local communities may not. We also have a structure of government that's a little bit unique and a little bit different. There is currently, with those 109 federally recognized tribes in the state, 450,000 acres of tribal trust land. Tribal trust land has a little bit different legal authority than any other land, and some of you that work with tribal communities understand that. You may have run into that. For those in law enforcement, California is one of the very unique tribes that has Public Law 280. Um, on tribal trust land, which is federal land, we as a tribe maintain civil jur uh, jurisdiction, regulatory. So there is no county or state civil regulatory on tribal trust lands. But in California, it's one of the very few states in the United States that maintains criminal jurisdiction on tribal trust lands here in California. It's very important for law enforcement, fire, EMS to understand those unique, very unique uh, relationships with respect to land. Again, in California, there's 450,000 acres of tribal trust lands that is managed by those 109 tribes, but they also have fee lands. Those fee lands then are regulated by the state, civil um, and criminal as well. But there are also what they call public domain allotments um, that have different jurisdictions. And again, for those in law enforcement, you may have heard through the news over the years um, some issues that have pertained, but that's a whole other discussion. We won't talk about that now. But anyone in law enforcement that wants information, please, I can, I can uh, refer to you for a few folks if I can't answer the questions myself. Access, I said, sovereignty, very important to understand. As a tribal government, we are a government. We are a sovereign government. And so we have responsibilities as a government to provide for our people. But it doesn't mean that we aren't interacting with those outside. You will find a lot of tribes now have pretty evolved emergency management programs. I'm very proud that Yosha Dehi right up the street has one of the best tribal fire departments in the whole uh, state of California. We're, we're not as close as you are, but we're getting there at Yosha Dehi um, at Tuolumne uh, compared to Yosha Dehi. But there are really some fantastic emergency management, emergency service programs in, in the state that are evolving. Phenomenal fire departments, not just in structure, but wildland. We have a 24-7 uh, structure, but we also have a hand crew. We put those folks out on, on other fires, not just tribal fires. So we're entering into mutual aids with our local jurisdictions um, within the state, whether it's federal as well um, or state. We have a tribal CERT team. I have a tribal CERT team. I'm a CERT program manager and a CERT instructor. Um, I, I, you know, I have my mother in the background over there. She's one of our tribal CERT members. I'm very proud of that. But we're one, going to be one of the first, um, definitely in the state of California, if not the country, as a tribal CERT team that's going to provide firefighter rehab to the county fire. So we're really excited about that. Um, but it's just a, what I want to do is emphasis, emphasize that tribal community programs and emergency services are not what you think they are. They really have grown. They have developed. We're still growing. Understand that the breadth of or 
Um, the difference between some of the very small tribes um, who have no emergency services program and then some of the tribes that have some very detailed, uh, very evolved, very mature emergency services program, whether it's fire, law enforcement capabilities, EMS, um, and, and CERT programs. When we talk about governance, one of the things we really try to emphasize in this uh, presentation about the tribal perspective is under Executive Order uh, 13175, which is where that unique relationship between a federally recognized tribe has with the United States government. That's that sovereignty and that relationship. And that order specifically lays out the consultation and coordination that the federal government will have with federally recognized tribes. Public Law uh, 112-96, so that's the specific first net. Uh, law and language is in there that delineates and mandates interaction with tribal communities. That's why I'm sitting here today, but why we're trying to outreach to those tribal communities and be involved. So FirstNet is doing a great job at providing those teams um, that exist out there um, to interact with those tribal communities. In the Executive Order B-10-11, that's specific to here to California, um, the governor signed that executive order that establishes that direct uh, communication and consultation. So every state agency under that executive order is mandated now to consult and coordinate and communicate with tribal, uh, tribal communities, with those 109 federally recognized tribes. Tribal interactions specific to FirstNet at the national level. Um, uh, mentioned Kevin McGinnis, who's on the FirstNet board. He's the lead kind of tribal outreach. Um, we have a public safety advisory committee, as, as Vicki talked about, they're specific to tribal outreach. There are 566 tribes in the whole United States. So uh, FirstNet has quite a chore um, at outreach into all those tribal communities. And then of course Carl Rebstock, I have not met him, but he was the lead in the managing side of FirstNet for tribal communities. Um, and those individuals are there. At the state level, so under the governor's office, there's a, uh, a tribal advisor, Cynthia Gomez, who sits on CalFern uh, board, and then she helped create the tribal advisory committee. That committee consists of myself uh, from Tuolumne, Michael Despain, who's from the Ch uh, Machupta tribe in Chico, uh, Matthew uh, Rantanen, who is with the Southern California Tribal Chairmen's Association. They are located in uh, Paula in San Diego County, and then Bill Denke, uh, Denke, excuse me, with Saquon Tribal Police out of El Cajon. And I do believe that um, there was a uh, fifth individual uh, that was from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, she has moved on to a different agency, and they will be replenishing or replacing that person with somebody from Northern California, from a tribe in Northern California. So 20% of tribes are all in California alone, 566 in the whole United States. Um, so 20% are here in California. We're second to uh, Alaska. Alaska has 229 federally recognized tribes, but we have 109 in California. There are a lot of what we call unrecognized tribes in California, and that's a whole other discussion with some history in California. Um, but in 2010, um, the U.S. Census counted to 0.75 million Native Americans in California alone. Um, and so one of the things that the language specifically uh, needs to do in one of those challenges is sharing those equitable allocation. So because a lot of tribal communities are in remote areas, and because tribes are in areas that are in emergency services still growing, um, and, and is growing very rapidly in tribal communities, um, out of just sheer need, but out of being responsible and having the capacity and the capability to provide those services, um, limited access and coordination can be difficult. There are some tribal communities have phenomenal relationships with their county. I am very, very proud to say that Tuolumne uh, Band of Miwok Indians has a phenomenal relationship with our county. And that was before the Rim Fire. But during the Rim Fire, we were part of the solutions. We actually housed the ICP, the Erickson helicopter, was reloading on tribal trust lands. Our brand new hotel that had opened in April um, had to be closed because of the road closures, but we offered it to CAL FIRE and visiting law enforcement. Um, we were part of the solution. We have a great relationship with our county. Yosha Dehi does a great job with Yolo County. There are other tribes throughout the state um, that have phenomenal relationships um, with their county and in those tribal communities, but there are some counties that do not, and that is still growing, and we want to really encourage, encourage that, but it is a challenge. Some opportunities and specific benefits, uh, FirstNet and the 3 in 1 network will offer services in even remote areas. This is where I think, even though it may be a challenge with respect to tribal communities, it really is a benefit. We have two cell, cell towers on tri our tribal lands. We have a Verizon and an AT&T 4G. 
wow, how many folks know that tribal communities now have their own cell towers or have leases to operate cell towers? So that's, I think, a big push with respect to FirstNet to be able to go out there and understand that and realize the capabilities that tribal communities have. We also have uniqueness in the relationships we have with the federal government that we don't have to go through county zoning and ordinance and CEQA, but we have federal statutes that we had by by, but there's some definite opportunities. Uh, commitment to bring service to where the public safety first responders are. We consider ourselves as tribal communities first responders as well. We understand that disaster has no boundaries. So not only are we are protecting our tribal community, but we're working really hard to help protect the outside. A wildfire starts in tribal lands, it doesn't stop at the door. It may go next door. So we are part, we're participants in that, in that response. And so there's some great opportunities in that. We are first responders as well. Commercial providers may be encouraged to augment their services. Again, we have some great relationships. We may be able to help uh, with that. Sacred and cultural areas um, for tribal communities, this is number one. This is key to us. Whether it's on our tribal trust land or in a ge geographical area, again, without going to the history of Californian tribes, most of California at one time was occupied by a tribal community. So we have spots throughout the state that are important to us. Understanding that at the get-go with FirstNet and identifying those areas um, will probably resolve some future issues when it comes to uh, sacred or cultural sites, definitely if you wanted to locate towers in, in a particular area. Working together, one of the things I really stress for those communities, whether it's FirstNet as an organization or as a, a deployment in the activities, is no assumptions. Don't assume a tribal community has the capability. Don't assume that we don't have services that we could provide to help you. Don't assume that we may not understand words like interoperability and those communications, the things that we're striving um, to do within our own tribal community. Changes in Stafford Act, for those that don't, I always say this, we now can declare directly um, with the president as a tribe. We don't have to go through the county or their state, but that doesn't mean that we won't do that. So understand that we have some uniqueness um, in relationship to disasters and emergencies that may impact tribal communities. FirstNet deployment officer opportunity for that interagency. Really, at the end of the day, this is what this is all about. It's for us to be able to communicate with each other. We need you, you need us. And in order for us to help each other at the end, uh, during an event, an emergency or disaster, we gotta be able to communicate. So involving us from this ground level is key and important to doing that. Kind of uh, in conclusion, I'm getting really uh, fast through here. This is actually the uh, King uh, fire. I, I took this off the internet. Um, we, we, we pay attention, obviously, to what's happening. Um, there are some great challenges and opportunities um, in the FirstNet deployment for tribal communities. As I said, it's mandated to involve tribal communities as a federal entity. Um, there's a lot to do out there, but there's a lot of benefits to that, things that we can offer uh, maybe to help those communities and help this system deploy. Working together definitely within um, the tribal communities here in the state as well as nationally, I think is also very key because of that ability to talk to each other uh, when something goes down. We're, we're catching up and we wanna be involved in that process. Specific language addressing that unmet needs of California tribes, definitely. Um, as I said, you have such a difference between tribe 109 over here and tribe number one over here. One may have no land base, one may have thousands and thousands of acres of land. One tribe may have a full 24-7 uh, fire, functional fire department, um, great capabilities, and others are still relying on somebody else to help them. Um, some have CERT programs, some have EMS, some have uh, wildfire capabilities, you name it. And so um, understanding that there should be some specific language that addresses that un unmet needs. Um, enables tribes to communicate and coordinate, obviously. Again, disaster has no boundaries whatsoever. Um, we are very, very proud of what we've been doing with emergency programs here in California. Proud to say that there are a group of us who are creating um, tribal type three teams. I mean, we are getting qualified. We are being a part of the solution because we are not only citizens as of California, but we are also tribal members in our communities and we have that responsibility. So that's it. That's all I have, unless there's any questions. But that's my contact information. Please, if anybody has any questions. Dory, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, any questions from the panel? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Our next presenter is Mr. Carl Padroni. Uh,
Carl is the American Medical Response General Manager and has over 24 years of experience in the industry with 14 years of management experience. Mr. Padroni has worked in both urban and rural communities managing multiple counties as well as large communication centers. Mr. Padroni participated in multiple initiatives from clinical achievements such as the 12 lead electrocardio program to implementing new radio and automatic vehicle location global positioning systems. Mr. Padroni has developed and implemented several system designs in the greater Sacramento area and provided oversight for several building projects, including the expansion of the current communication center in Sacramento with 25 seats, managing more than 700 requests for service per day. Currently, Mr. Padroni is responsible for oversight of ambulance, oper ambulance operations in Sacramento and three additional Northern California counties, critical care transport for Northern California, and the Sacramento Communication Center. Collectively, Mr. Padroni is responsible for more than 400 line level personnel and 25 management teams. Welcome, Mr. Padroni. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and um, Mike Hector, thanks for having me here. And um, they kind of asked me to represent kind of the, you know, the specific to the 12th lead piece, and I have a unique perspective being, I think, the only private entity um, presenting today because I'm not a, a, a directly a public agency, but obviously affiliated with many in different counties and cities and that. Um, so specifically to talk about uh, just a couple of things, kind of the, the clinical side, 12 lead EKG, electronic patient care reports. I'll briefly talk about some of the video stuff we're kind of broaching on. It's an interesting world out there when we try to transmit patient video over LTE because there's a whole other world of encryption and HIPAA and things that we start dealing with when we start putting patient video into a hospital from a scene. It's a, been an interesting road for us. And then I'm just going to briefly touch how we're dealing with um, integration of some of these uh, LTE technologies for communication over um, LMR integration and some IP things that we're doing and how we use mobile dispatch computers and that. So, you know, the, the biggest thing we're using live today is we use physio monitors, physio control in, our, in my areas. Um, I know in this county they use Zoll, but all these, com these leading companies have products similar to this where they can transmit 12 VDKGs. We probably all remember the Johnny and Roy days of the, we call them APGARs, the orange box where you could transmit a single EKG tracing to the hospital. Um, so today, if you look at that box in the bottom of the picture, that's actually an LTE modem that ties into the monitor and we can actually directly send a full diagnostic 12 lead from the field, um, like this one, goes right to, not only to the hospital, which is kind of how we originally started sending this, it would go to a dedicated computer in the emergency room and the ER doc could see it. Um, the technology now allows it to send it to multiple endpoints at the same time. So the cardiologist gets it on their iPad at the same time it arrives in the ER and those kind of things. So it enables those teams to improve what they call that door to balloon time that much faster. When the cardiologist sees this on his iPad, it kind of gives him a different reaction than hearing that he has a patient with an ST elevation MI coming into the ER. So it's greatly reduced, you know, some of the studies are showing as much as 10 minutes quicker that we can get that team in going directly to the iPads and such with 12 VG EKGs. Um, we kind of started that program directly to the ED only about six years ago and about the last three years it's actually gotten out through servers to iPads and that and a lot, lot faster um, to the doctors. But at the end of the day, it's still reliant on commercial LTE networks, right, from the back of that monitor. So I'm kind of excited about FirstNet from that end for us. So this is kind of how that system works today, right? We kind of have the life pack um, gateway, goes through their system, writes the ED doc and cardiologist. And while well, the picture kind of animation looks like it goes um, in chronological order, it really does all happen in, in real time um, to all those destinations at the same time. So really making a change in patient outcomes. Small bandwidth when it comes to talking about that, it's not like video, so um, we're not tying up a lot of bandwidth. Matter of fact, we have dedicated rate plans for those modems. And if those of you who aren't transmitting, you can go to all your major carriers now and get a specific plan because they know that that box is locked down, that's all it can do, you can't make a phone call over that box, it's plugged into the back of the monitor. So it's kind of a small shot from these guys, from Physio as far as, what, you can also pull data on the back end, that's huge by doing these things, because now we can look at outcomes and measure uh, outcome data, it's, is what we're doing making a difference, right? Are those patients walking out of the hospital and we tie all that back into the data system so we can do continuing education. Um, electronic patient care records, it all ties together. We um, have now moved on to the next generation. We all started kind of with laptops and such. We've now, uh, in my areas, have moved over to a tablet 
Um, it's a touchscreen tablet, also um, dedicated to a wife using a cellular backbone to get that data over. Um, a little thing I don't know if you guys know, we're not allowed to keep any data on the device. So the LTE connection is you know, paramount for us because that patient data has to leave the device. It can't be stored on the device. Um, so that's a big deal for us. We are moving to where we're going to take photos now and such from scenes that we can incorporate as part of the PCR. Um, and that's also going to start taking up more bandwidth. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so new things coming down the pipe there. Um, and eventually, they believe we'll be able to do video with the cameras on the tablets. Um, but the, the security and compression rates are an interesting animal. I'm not quite that big, big of a tech guru, but that kind of tends to be the limiting factor right now is bandwidth over LTE and making that work and making all the security stuff over all those virtual private networks work well. Um, and of course, then we have the hospital side, right? If any of you guys have done IT security, you have your own you know, security within your department or for in my case, in my business unit, and then you have hospital systems with their whole level of security. And you need everyone willing to play in the sandbox to transmit that data, um, particularly in real time, right? It becomes a big security risk if it's not done right. Um, but that's where, as you know, Ryan said, we're going with the video piece. Now, I think that's a ways down the line because of those hurdles. It's, it's quick to say them, but it's a long time to overcome the security issues, I think. But we'll see. Hopefully that gets there quick. Um, what we're doing with Land Mobile Radio, we're partnered with this company. We're actually doing some of the things that we're talking about today, um, not in a mission critical way. Um, we use these in our non-emergency units and that, but we um, are currently using an application from um, this company, SLA Corporation, to integrate our LMRs and our smartphones um, on the back end so that you can actually key up on your iPhone and talk to an LMR radio on the other end. Um, it does work. You know, again, we're not using it mission critical. It's kind of a backup for us. Um, we have to carry radios for all of you guys that we work with in public safety, plus we have our own LMR network, um, and then we have the backup with the phone piece. Smartphones are giving us some other interesting things that we're able to do, uh, particularly with the maps. Not only can you see the actual hard asset, in our case we use um, the Android-based phones, you can track the phone, but the interesting thing is you can create ad hoc groups from the phone itself. You can actually just grab and zoom in on a map and you can create an immediate talk group of everybody in the vicinity of the map. And it's an ad hoc group that you can do as the end user. So if you had an incident in a building and you wanted to talk to everyone in that building, you could zoom into that building and hit push to talk and you would be talking with just those folks. Um, so it is kind of slick from that regard. Um, and you can remotely change permissions with, at one terminal. So in our comm center, we can change permissions from phones or add them to groups as well if somebody can't um, add those groups in there. Um, it's tied to the back end. Again, you know, if you're using it, it is LTE based. So you have to have that interconnection. It's ties to servers and gateways in the back end. Um, and in our case, we added the complication of our own network. So um, we're actually tying our LMR network to the internet as over LTE carriers um, and then to our communication center. So that's continuing to evolve. It works pretty well for us. Um, and it is down backwards compatible to 2G um, with the current uh, system we're working with for non-mission critical voice, but it does work. Um, so it's pretty slick. Also integrates with iPad. Um, matter of fact, if anyone wants to see it later, I can show you on my iPad. I have all our units, my units on it. Um, so the nice thing for us is I can listen to it, get to it from anywhere I have a cellular connection. I don't have to be in my home area like with an LMO our land mobile radios, right? If I had a portable, I kind of need to be in my jurisdiction for me to receive that audio, whereas this I can receive since it's over IP anywhere I can get a, a cellular connection. So that's a nice tool as well. They do have, believe it or not, have already come out with the handheld mics and such to tie to your smartphones. So that's where we're heading down the road there. Um, of course, we use LTE to track all our vehicles. Um, this is one of our vehicle tracking maps to show our resources in this geography. Um, so again, that's still dependent on the cellular network. Um, so LTE would be huge, because just like you guys, we run into those issues of prioritization. Um, we turn up the polling cycle. Of course, that just increases bandwidth requirements. Um, and just another close look at vehicle tracking. Um, and then we send over to our dispatch computers and mapping and that too, um, as we go to scenes and such, just like you guys. That's our other, and then we're not sending video over that yet, just text. Um, and the last piece, because they only wanted me to talk for about 10 minutes, um, is our dispatch integration. We uh, have a need, just like you guys, to be able to have some redundancy. We have a lot of redundancy into that center. Um, you know, like I said, we have a 25-seat 25 25 center, excuse me, 
um, in Sacramento, but at times we have to be able to move those calls or take them elsewhere. Um, so we have these devices called Mobile Ready Office that runs over an LTE network. Um, we plug a, a LTE card into this. This boosts that output to a 3 watt antenna instead of a 0.6 watt antenna that's usually off one of your air card kind of things. And then we can run uh, our full CAD system and radio system over that black box because we went all radio over IP. So anywhere that black box goes, I can talk to all of our systems and just bring it up on a telex console. Um, so that enables us to go mobile or I'll also set up off-site things. So for example, a state fair, when we cover that event, we, we take that box in there because they don't have any land connectivity in the place they stick us. So we stick that black box there with the dedicated dispatcher um, and they're able to access all of our CAD systems and every radio in Northern California that we operate on from that box over LTE. So that's the quick rundown of how we're using different LTE technologies. Thank you, Carl. Uh, sure. Any questions from the panel for Mr. Pedroni? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're at that part of our meeting now where we're going to open questions up to our audience. Uh, if you have any questions for our panel members or our presenters. Uh, in doing so, please go ahead and raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone over to you so you can ask your question. Um, You're going to get the stand and all. Hi, I'm Carol Carol Kane. I'm the IT manager for the Solano County Sheriff's Office. Carol, can we get you to stand up? Oh, I, sure. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but so because I'll sure. just make it. Thank you. Um, Looking ahead, and I realize there aren't answer. Uh, there, there probably aren't any answers today, but things that I'm thinking of that I think should be on the roadmap. Uh, one is in California as a law enforcement agency connecting into Cal DOJ's uh, backbone for our CLETs, et cetera. Um, we do have some requirements for mobile device management and I was wondering if FirstNet has on their roadmap to address perhaps for FirstNet devices offering some type of a uh, mobile device management uh, either at the carrier level or, or the software level or I, I don't know if like uh, who will be creating or building these devices but if at that level or even at the network level so that we would be able to do things like find my device, disable it, wipe it, brick it, whatever. But I mean that's going to be right out of the gate. Uh, a problem for everybody. So maybe at the first net level, think about solutions uh, so that that's just part of your first net device is a solution for mobile device management, which is also a CGIS requirement for, for from Cal DOJ, so, or actually CGIS FBI, so we're going to have to think about it anyway. So that would be one thing. Um, I'm also thinking that if there's a, a segmented set of frequencies for first responders in FirstNet, um, could we look to uh, working with CalDOJ, and I'm thinking California because that's who we are, but CalDOJ to perhaps get upgrade applications for devices that are on FirstNet to make it easier to do upgrades of our, of our CLETS networks if it's a FirstNet device there's, you know, 10 pages less, we have to a answer questions. Uh, so again, that's just something that I would suggest be on, be on the roadmap because I think everyone who is going to be uh, law enforcement, who's going to be using the first net devices will have to think about that. And I had written, um, it, I assume that the first net devices could be purchase purchasable by the public, but that would be the different frequency. So they would be sort of a different beast, because I, I had heard about potentially uh, letting public subscribe, but that would be a different set of frequencies. Anyway, so then I was thinking uh, CJ stuff, but that may not apply because there are separate frequencies. Anyway, that was those were my comments or questions. I don't know if there are answers right now, but that's stuff I'd be thinking about looking ahead. Do 
any of our panel members can address that? Yes, to your, um, your questions on the mobile device management, that is a key component of the local control that FirstNet is building in. So we would, you know, we would have authentication, identification, management, and, and the device tracking piece would be a part of that. So that, that is part of the plan. Um, the segmented frequencies, I will check and uh, get back to, to Hector or, or through Karen or, or somebody to, to check on that for you. And then on the devices by the public, that would be part of a spectrum leasing agreement with a partner. And um, again, I, I, think, I think you're right, it would be, you know, they'd be operating differently. They wouldn't be sort of, you know, occupying the same space as a secure databases and things like that. So I think that that will be addressed in the <coughs> leasing agreement. Yep. Thank you, Vicki. Any other questions? Thank you. I just wanted to let you know that I have actually uh, connected some of the FirstNet engineers up to Cal DOJ folks that are working on the, the, the MDM uh, soft, software applications, and so they're very aware of what Cal DOJ is working on, and I'm hopeful that they'll um, be coordinating with them working together. That would be nice. Yes. I want to add on to this, as a tag team to the answers here. You had some very thoughtful questions. Uh, with, with respect, uh, you'll get the official answer um, <clears throat> from FirstNet through Vicky, but as far as your frequency question, uh, we're all on that 700 megahertz, what they call band class 14 frequency. They'll be the primary uh, public safety users, which will be folks in this room, uh, plus folks that help with public safety, such as the utilities or public works, they're going to clear the road to get the fire trucks through. Secondary users in the recent interpretation that Vicki mentioned uh, that just got released last week, that includes non-public safety users, as you'd mentioned. They're still going to be on that same band class 14, but the interpretation includes that they are the ones that are going to be subject to prioritization and preemption. Preemption basically means when the ambulance comes through the road, you pull to the side. And so the same thing would happen with frequency to the place, place that you might be degraded or actually just turned off. So again, this is a network that's dedicated by and for public safety use. Thank you, Michael. We had a question back there. Dr. Dixon, excuse me, Dixon Fire Department. How do the privates view this project? Uh, do they view it as a competitor because potentially there's thousands of contracts that could get canceled for iPad service, cellular service, uh, air card service, or do they view it as a business opportunity because they could be partnering public-private partnership to uh, either get subcontracted or to be part of this solution? Thanks. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's the latter since the, it's a business opportunity for them. Um, the legislation says that we cannot directly compete with the commercial world. So, um, so we're obviously not going to direct to consumers and we are offering different services than what the commercial services provide. But I would say, yeah, with the RFP and with uh, coming out, the RFI now and then the RFP, I think is certainly um, not just for the, the big telecommunications companies, but for rural telecoms, tribal telecoms, that it presents an opportunity for everybody to participate and build a network together. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, any other questions? Wait. I'll, I'll add a little two cents on that, too. I, I can probably say a little more since I'm not first net. So this is Mike's opinion. But one of the things, I, I think there, it can go both ways, uh, just, just as was alluded to. First net would like it to be an opportunity in them to come in here and uh, very much you know, engage in that RFP process. And we want them to, too, as public safety stakeholders. Um, However, if you look at it, uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, had a, uh, a pilot. They were one of the BTOP, uh, ones that I described, early builder types. And what happened was uh, they had their service, and then all of a sudden Verizon lowered the price on their commercial service and made it less attractive, and the business pay case disappeared for their doing their, thing, their own thing. So there's going to be a real danger in this and opportunity, and we'll see which way it goes. But Look at it from a public safety user perspective. If prices go down, that's not a bad thing either. So in the whole, uh, I think it's going to be a benefit.
Hi, Ren. Randy Hager, Alameda County. Um, I have two questions. So when, is, um, when are the subscriber minimum specs uh, going to be set? And I ask that because there are already uh, hybrid devices out there. The manufacturers or the, or the sellers of those devices claim that they are going to be first net compatible or upgradable. Uh, and so my take is, well, how do we as government employees verify that? So that's the first question. The second is, um, in terms of uh, the site locations, I would imagine that FirstNet, the entity, will negotiate with some of the commercial carriers to use some of their sites, their existing sites, um, depending on what their needs are and where they need sites. And so assuming that they do that, uh, can we also assume that those commercial sites will be hardened? Uh, yes, uh, the minimum specs, um, that will come out of the RFI that we have specifically on questions related to devices and then later to the, to the RFP. So um, the carriers know that uh, the, the devices need to be um, band 14 class, uh, band class 14, and they also need to, um, you know, we want to have other, other band classes in there too, so there's some interoperability there as we transition to FirstNet. Um, on the site hardening, yes, that would be a condition of the partnership. Shelly Nelson, I'm a LMR communications manager. To follow on Randy's question about coverage, absolutely, the frequencies are valuable and you have to have them and the cost of this system to the user is going to be very important but there's an adage out there that coverage is king. It doesn't matter how much it costs or how many frequency you have, if I can't get into it, we can't use it. So I, it's more of a statement than a question. Coverage is gonna be king. Absolutely. Any other questions? Um, I can't read that up there, Paul. Uh, one of the questions that we have from over WebEx is, I see comments about several applica applications to be used over FirstNet. Who will be, uh, who will pay for the development of the applications? There's a question about the what we call the application ecosystem in the RFI. So that's one of the items that we are collecting information on now that will be uh, incorporated into the draft RFP. Do we have any other questions, Paul? No. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, I would like to thank uh, all of our panel members and all of our presenters today uh, for taking time out of your busy schedules and definitely giving us some inform great information on FirstNet and what it means for California. Um, one of the things I heard today in, during the presentations, two, two big things. One, FirstNet is still in the process of gathering information. Uh, FirstNet is going to be for you, the first responders. <coughs> Uh, so it's important that when presented with the opportunity to definitely make sure that you get your input into how FirstNet is going to be designed for California. As a person who's designed major communication systems, I know that that system is only going to be as good as the input we get to develop that system. So take that opportunity to provide that information. And speaking of that, uh, you will be receiving a survey in via email and that is to gather business needs of the user community. So please take time to fill that out. Uh, if you would like, please pass it on to some of your constituents, ask them to fill it out and return it to uh, our office. Or if you have uh, questions after today's town hall, uh, you can refer them to uh, calfrn, C-A-L-F-R-N, 
at caloas.ca.gov. So uh, this basically concludes the town hall for today. Thank you very much uh, for participation from all the audience members and again from our panel and our speakers. We do appreciate it. Uh, please be careful driving home today or back to work, whichever you're going to. Thank you very much.